Hello there. Thanks again for joining us for our Bible study. We're in the book of James, and this is uh, Deep Springs Baptist Church. We would love to have you join us sometime if you live in the area. And uh, you can find us on our Facebook page. Follow us there. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get these weekly updates. We stream our Sunday morning services on our Facebook page. It's Deep Springs Baptist Church in Peachland, North Carolina. We're in the book of James, chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 7 through 12 today. So we'll start by reading it. He says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by the heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay, nay, lest you fall into condemnation. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, open the words, uh, open the eyes of our heart that we may perceive the truth of your holy word. I pray that you grant me your anointing as a teacher and open our eyes and ears to behold wonderful things from the word. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's just jump right in. Now, in our previous study, you'll remember that the, the first six verses of this chapter were aimed at the wicked rich. Perhaps there were those in the assembly or they were connected somehow with the church. And uh, there was a, a strong denunciation by James for those who had gotten their wealth by uh, oppressing the poor. So now there's a shift in emphasis. Notice the word brethren is going to be repeated over and over. And of course, that's a, uh, uh, that, that's a term reserved for believers. If you remember, uh, Jesus said, who are my brothers? And it was all of those who believe on him. So, so there's now a shift um, of emphasis here. There's also an emphasis on the word patience. Now, there's a couple of different words for patience in the Greek. One is the word makrothemeo, and that's the one that's most uh, most occurs here in this passage. And that word means to be long-tempered, uh, ha having a long fuse, not not a hot head. And so, uh, most Bible scholars believe that this this particular word for patience deals with uh, dealing with others. So how do we respond to uh, being treated poorly by others? Um, so that's uh, that, that's an, an emphasis here. The other word that's that's mentioned uh, is hupomone. That's that's another Greek word for patience or endurance, and it means to bear up under difficult circumstances. So. Sometimes the words are used interchangeably, so we won't make too big of a thing of it, but just wanted you to be aware of that. So James says to be patient unto the coming of the Lord. You know, there's a coming a time when the roles will be reversed, when the wicked of this world will not be uh, rejoicing. Uh, the rich men who have, got, who have gotten their their wealth by oppressing the poor, they won't be enjoying it. All of their luxury and pleasure will be turned into mourning. And we dealt with that last week. Uh, Vernon McGee, J. Vernon McGee says, there is coming a day when these roles will be reversed, but it won't be uh, the next primary or the general election. We have to keep that in mind. Uh, the politicians all make great promises that they're going to care for the poor and the middle class and so forth. But there is coming a day. And that's what James points our emphasis to. We are to look for the coming of the Lord. Now, no man knows the day of uh, the day or the hour, and, and so it is futile for us to speculate as to the timing of, of uh, the coming of the Lord. But it is, however, a, a motivating factor. And you'll notice here the emphasis is on the coming of the Lord. Now, I'm probably going to make some people mad here, but I, I would urge you, and I just plead with you as your brother in Christ, don't turn this off. Uh, if you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture view, don't turn this off, but, but just listen with an open mind. I believe this is something we can agree to disagree 
about, and we can do it charitably. I firmly believe that the Bible teaches that the church will not go through the tribulation period. That is the 70th week of Daniel, as outlined in Daniel chapter 9. And it has to do with Daniel's people, and, and uh, those are the Jews and the holy city. And so, so much confusion has, uh, has arisen in recent years about the, uh, the doctrine of the rapture, and, uh, or the catching away. The, the Greek word is the harpazo, from 1 Thessalonians 4. But uh, so much confusion arises from a misunderstanding of the Olivet Discourse. That's Matthew 24 and 25. When Jesus gives the Olivet Discourse, he's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about the tribulation period and the things that are going to happen in Israel. Notice all of the Israel-centric things in Matthew 24. The abomination of desolation, that's happening in the temple. Uh, Jerusalem is, is mentioned. And... Um, uh, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. That's a Jewish concern. Um, pray that your flight be not in the winter. That, again, that's a Jewish concern because of the rainy season. The wadis filling up make it, make it, would make it difficult to, to flee. Also, they're to flee into the wilderness. Well, what are, what are we to do here in, uh, I'm in North Carolina, so what wilderness do I flee to if this applies to me? And it doesn't. And so all of that stuff in Matthew 24 and 25 that's stuff that was revealed in the Old Testament. Uh, and it was commonly referred to as the day of the Lord. When Christ physically comes to the earth and uh, sets up his kingdom. That's not what happens at the rapture. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about this. <clears throat> so, James says we are to be looking for the Lord, not Antichrist. Okay? The, the, the overall tenor of the New Testament letters, especially Paul's letters is that we're not looking for Antichrist. We're looking for the Lord. You see, any other rapture view, whether it be mid-trib or post-trib, it always has the coming of Jesus, if it's mid-trib, at least three and a half years away, or um, if it's post-trib, at least seven years away. So it, those views uh, are at odds with what the Bible teaches as the imminent return of Christ, that he could return at any time. And so if you're honest about it, that is the, the pre-trib is the only view that preserves the doctrine of eminence, which I believe James is teaching here. And he says, we're to be looking for the Lord. That is, why, that is a motivating factor. Now, John 14, if you're looking for the rapture, don't look for it in Matthew 24. Look for it in John 14. Matthew 24 happens early in the Passion Week. John 14 happens late in the Passion Week, in the upper room, uh, the upper room discourse. Jesus says, John 14, 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, now where did he go? He went to heaven. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Well, where is he? He's in heaven. And if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, read it with an open mind, it says that we will meet the Lord in the air, not on the ground. At the second coming, Jesus is coming to the earth to set up his kingdom. At the rapture, we meet him in the clouds. Read it with an open mind and a willingness to see what, what is said there. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Notice there's no signs mentioned prior to that. Not the coming of Antichrist. Not the, the sun and the moon and the stars showing signs and wonders. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Well, wait a minute. The second coming is not a mystery. That, that's, that's all throughout the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi. So what's the mystery? Well, he's going to tell you. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's the rapture. There's going to be a group of people who are alive when the Lord returns for his church. And we're not going to die. We're, we're going to be changed in a moment, Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye. Literally in an atom of time in the Greek. And we're going to go meet the Lord in the air, you see. And that was, why did Paul say that was a mystery? Because that was not revealed prior. Um, now, John 14, Jesus alludes to the rapture. But this, Paul has the formal teaching on this doctrine. So don't go looking for it in Matthew 24. And that's why so many people are so doggone confused. 
is because they're looking at things regarding the second coming that have nothing to do with the rapture. Titus 2.13, Paul says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the Antichrist. Is that what it says? No. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, this is a great verse on uh, the deity of Christ, showing that Jesus is indeed, uh, he's the Savior and he's God. Sadly, uh, people have gone from the blessed hope to no hope at all. Oh no, there's no blessed hope. You're going to go through all the, the wrath of God and the tribulation and the Antichrist. L listen, Jesus said that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I take Jesus at his word. Now here's the thing. A lot of people, they mean well, and here's, here's, the base, here's their basic premise. They think, well, uh, the early church had to go through tribulation. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation. Paul says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All of that is true. But that's tribulation with a lowercase t. Not great tribulation with, a, with a, an uppercase t. They are different. They're, they're very different. So what I'm saying to you is, the, the rapture is not an escape from suffering. Beloved, we're all going to suffer in this life. Do you know for the last 2,000 years, Christians have been suffering? And a lot of folks have died and they've gone to heaven and they didn't have to go through the great tribulation, but they went through lowercase t tribulation. And, so is, and, and that's the case for you and I. We're going to have trouble in this life. We're not promised um, an easy time. But, but don't let that overshadow your view of the big picture here. The tribulation period is a specific time period that deals with a specific issue, and that is to bring Israel to faith. It has nothing to do with the church. But it's not just pie in the sky, okay? Dwight Pentecost, he did a study on the coming of the Lord and, and all the mentions of it in the New Testament. And he says, almost without fail, it's always followed by an exhortation to holiness and godly living. So you see, our view of the coming of the Lord, it shouldn't lead us to arrogance. Uh, it shouldn't lead us to be fighting on the internet over whose position is right or wrong. It shouldn't lead us to stare up at the sky or to make charts uh, trying to figure out when the Lord is coming back because no man knows, knows the day or the hour. But what it should do is motivate us to godly living and motivate us to evangelism, sharing our faith with others. It's a purifying hope. Notice what 1 John 3, 2 says. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, and every man that hath this hope, what hope? The hope of being having a body like Christ and seeing him at his coming. Every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. So it's a purifying hope. Now in Matthew 24, and I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth here. Matthew 24, I believe is talking about the tribulation period. But the principle is the same. Notice this, verse 46. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he comes shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler of all of his goods. But... And if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite the, his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he does not look for him and in an hour which he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So uh, and it's an evil heart that says, well, my Lord's delaying his coming. He can't come today. He's, you know, he's at least three years away or seven years away. That's an evil mindset. Uh, Peter, Second Peter, I think it's chapter three. He warned that in the last days, scoffers would come. They would say, where's the promise of his coming? Because all things continue as they have for the, uh, since the beginning of creation. So this is the heart and the soul of our passage here in James chapter five. The coming of the Lord should affect how we live, our attitudes, and our relationship with others. Okay, now back to James 5, verse 12. He's gonna give us three examples. He's gonna give us the example of the farmer, the example of the Old Testament prophets, and the example of Job. So let's look at the farmer now. 
Now the farmer has patience for the precious fruit of the earth. Uh, if you're a farmer or you know anybody that's a farmer, farming requires hard work. There are circumstances which are beyond his control. He can't control when it rains or, or when the sun uh, is going to shine. And he has to have a lot of patience. Now this again shows us the Jewish context. He, he mentions the early and the latter rain. In Israel, the latter rains happen in late April, uh, early May. The early rains happen in late October and early November. And it softens the ground for plowing. The latter rain happens again in April and May. And it's necessary to mature the crops before the harvest. Now some see here an allegory or a symbolism of an end times revival. And that may or may not be true, but I don't think that's what the, the, the context is teaching here. I think it's teaching us that we need to be patient. Uh, we said, why hasn't the Lord returned yet? Well, uh, Second Peter says that God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should repent. Now, there is coming a day when he will come, and nothing's going to stop him. But, uh, you know, there was a book that was popular in 1987, I think, uh, 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Come in 1988. And of course, that, that's a bestseller now, right? Uh, nobody wants to read that book because he violated the, the, the principle of interpretation about no man knows the day or the hour. But you know what? I'm thankful Christ didn't return in 1988 because I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't saved. So he says to be patient here. All right, James uh, 5, 8. Be you also patient. Also what? Just like the farmer. Establish, he says, the Greek word is sterizo. It means to strengthen or, or fasten firmly. Your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near. Now the Greek word for drawing nigh is in gezo. And it means also to be at hand. It doesn't mean to it, that it has arrived. But it means it is near or at hand. Or, to use our theological term, it's imminent. That word is used a lot in Matthew's gospel where Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom and he goes and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is what at hand. It's the same Greek word in Gizzo. And so such is the case with us now. The Lord's coming is at hand. It's not three years away. It's not seven years away. It's not this, this red heifer or this um, temple being rebuilt. Or whatever sign, or, the, or this Middle East war, or that Middle East war. All of those things are part and parcel with the end times. But the coming of the Lord is imminent. It's, it's at hand. James 5, verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, unless you be condemned. And notice we've got the third reference now to the coming of the Lord. Behold, the judge stands before the door. In other words, he's waiting to come in at any moment. He's not three years away. He's not seven years away. He's not this sign away, that sign away. This treaty, that treaty, this war, that war. He's at the door, ready to come. Now, beloved, if you'll be honest with yourself, you've got three verses right here in, in sequence, in rapid fire succession, that are teaching that Jesus could come at any moment. Okay? So for us to teach anything different, is uh, is not being true to the text. Now, did, does this mean that James believed that the Lord was going to come in his lifetime? Well, I think every church, I, I think every generation, Christ wants us to live as if he could come that, that way. But, but here's, here's the tragic irony. The early church, who was at least 2,000 years away from it, from our perspective, was looking for the Lord to come. Now, we, who were closer to the event, than they were are like no big deal Christ ain't coming today uh, he's got this has got to happen and that's got to happen and that's going to happen and I think it's a tragic irony that at the end of the age we are less anticipatory of his return than the early church was and that's an indictment on this it's not a compliment and our notice our directive here is not to grumble against Notice in verse 9, against one another, brethren. Well, you know, in all of our suffering and, and our, our, our problems that we go through in this life, James has already told us in chapter 1 that we're going to go through trouble, right? He says, count it all joy when you go through trials. 
Okay, so James is not teaching escapism here. I'm going to make a note for myself for my Wednesday night uh, study. Sorry. Thank you for indulging me there a moment. Um, if you want an example of what happens when Christians grumble or believers grumble, look at the book of Numbers. I'm going to read you Numbers 21, verse 4. It says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Uh, and we can point fingers at the wilderness wonders, but it was hot. It was hot and it was uncomfortable. And quite frankly, they had been a long time walking in circles, so to speak. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. You know, that's what we do. Uh, leadership is always the, the easy target. And they said, wherefore? Well, notice they spoke against God. It wasn't just against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water in our soul, long at this light bread. They failed to see that God had their best interests at heart. Verse 6, it says, And the Lord, Numbers 21, 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. And that's the story of the bronze serpent on the pole. Uh, Jesus, when he was talking to Nicodemus, he said, Even as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So it's a great story uh, to read. But their murmuring and complaining brought God's judgment. James tells us not to grumble or complain because the Lord, the judge, is standing at the door. Now listen, the unbeliever is going to be judged, of course. He's going to go through the tribulation period, but he's also going to be judged at the white throne judgment. Where he's going to be judged for every sin that he's ever done and thrown into the lake of fire. But the believers are going to be judged too. Not for salvation, but for our works. Romans 14, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says we. For it is written as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, Paul says, therefore judge nothing before the time. And he's talking about judging the motives of other believers. It's very tempting to do that. Until the Lord comes, notice he doesn't say Antichrist, until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all, that's everybody, all believers, must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Okay? So we've had three exhort exhortations now regarding the coming of the Lord. Now in James 5.10, he's going to talk about the prophets. Now, he says, Take the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. What was a prophet? We've kind of glamorized the prophet in the New Testament church. In the New Testament church, a lot of these so-called prophets... They go around and they speak over people and they say, oh, the Lord's going to give you a new job. He's going to give you a new house. He's going to give you a new car. He's going to give you a promotion. And he may do all of those things. But the role of the prophet in the Old Testament was to, uh, they, they were commissioned when the kings, when Israel demanded a king, and they were commissioned. And uh, their job was to tell the king, that he was doing wrong and to bring him back into alignment with God's word. Once the kingdom split, you know, after Solomon, you had Rehoboam, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, you had the kingdom in the north and then the kingdom in the south, Judah uh, and Benjamin. You know, out of the northern kingdom, there were 19 kings. Do you know how many of them were good? Goose egg. Not in, in it. None of them were good. Out of the southern kingdom, there were 20 kings and only eight of them were good. And then only some of the time, not all the time. What happened to these prophets? Did the kings, uh, did, did they treat them like royalty? No. Tradition tells us that Isaiah was sawn in two. He was sawn in half. Jeremiah was put in stocks. He was put in prison, put into the dungeon. Daniel was put in the lion's den. Look at what Elijah suffered at the hands of Ahab and Jezebel. 
And we could go on and on and on. As James has frequently done, I believe he's alluding to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So again, Jesus is appealing to the Old Testament prophets, and so is James. James 5.11, he says, Behold, we count them, the King James is happy. It might better be translated as blessed. The Greek word here is a verb, uh, makarizo, uh, verb form of the noun makarios, or the adjective makarios, which means blessed. Now, blessed are them which endure. Okay, So it's not just those who suffer, but those who do it patiently and they persevere. All right, now he's going to appeal to Job. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and a tender mercy. Now, James has already promised a reward for those who endure in James 1.12. Now we're going to look at Job. What did Job lose? Well, he lost his health. Uh, he lost his, uh, his wealth. He lost his family, except for his wife, who was uh, not so supportive. In, uh, in in his plight. Now, when you hear this, if you've ever read the book of Job, you think, well, gosh, was Job patient? I mean, he was saying a lot of things. Uh, he says, well, like, cursed is the day I was born, I think. So, uh, but, but don't misunderstand the, the end goal here. Let me give you a few snapshots from Job, just, just a few. Job one twenty two. it says, in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Job had his questions. You know, he had his, he was wrestling with his, you know, why, why me? Why now? Uh, why us? Why all of these tra tragedies? Job 2.10, but he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh, talking about his wife. Now, uh, Job got away with it. I don't know if you will. He says, what, shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive evil? In all of this did not Job sin with his lips, Job 2.10. So the emphasis on Job is on his, even though he was, you know, working through his questions, uh, praising through his pain, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But he didn't sin nor foolishly charge God. And notice the Bible speaks of the end of the Lord or the, what was the end goal of Job's uh, suffering? Well, look, it was his maturity and his blessing. Job 43, 12 says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the, his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. This was the end goal of Job's, of the Lord in Job's trial. Now, Job didn't have the book of Job like we did, so you know he doesn't understand what's going on. But we have the book of Job, and we can see. And now James appeals to it. Maybe this was also uh, not just a spectacle to Job and his friends, but perhaps a spectacle to the angels. You know, that we have a special relationship with the angels. They desire to look into the things that we've experienced. They, they don't fully understand us. And I don't fully understand people either. How about you? Now notice that at the end of James 5, 11, it says the Lord is very pitiful. Um, the Greek word here is a hapax legomenon. It means it only occurs one time in the New Testament. And I'm going to try to pronounce it. It's palu splontnos. Palu splontnos. And the literal translation of it is many bowels. Now, in the old culture, in Greek culture, uh, Greco-Roman culture, they believed that the seat of the emotion was the, the bowels, the, in, the belly, okay? We would say it this way. We would say God has a big heart. He's pit, very pitiful and of tender mercies. And you know, this is the one thing Satan did not want Job to realize. He wanted Job to curse God and die. He wanted Job to think that God was mean, hateful, and did not have his best interest at heart. But what James is reminding us here, and it's, it's, a, it's very important that we understand this, that God has a big heart. 
heart. He cares about you. He cares about me, even in our trial. And I dare say none of us have gone through anything quite as severe as Job. Certainly none of us have gone through anything as severe as Jesus Christ. But we know, Paul says, Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to those that love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. Now we get to the last verse in our study, James 5, 12. He says, above all these things, swear not neither by heaven, neither by the earth. And notice again, it's directed toward the brethren. Maybe this ties back to verse nine, not sure. Now, I don't think this is dealing with the issue of profanity. The Bible does uh, uh, address that. Ephesians 5 says, neither foolish, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. The NIV says, nor should there be obscenity, that would be profanity, foolish talk or coarse jesting, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So the Bible does deal with the issue of profane speech, but I don't think this is what it's talking about here. I think it's dealing with oaths and, uh, and, and truth and integrity in our speech. In other words, being a man or a woman of your word. Now, again, we're going to appeal to the Sermon on the Mount. So it's only fitting we should appeal to it one more time. Matthew 5, 33, Jesus said again. Let me get a drink of water. Sorry. Again, you have heard that it had been said of them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. In other words, you should not swear falsely. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall thou swear by thy head, because thou cannot make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So oaths were not prohibited in the Old Testament, but the issue was fulfilling your vows. And so... You know, those who, who were uh, military service, those who are witnesses in the courtroom, uh, they're, they're not sinning. Um, the religious leaders of Jesus' day and James' day, they had kind of found a loophole on swearing because they, they didn't want to swear by the name of God, of course. So they would, they would soften it up and they'd say, well, we swear by heaven or we swear by Jerusalem or we swear by the temple. And that was kind of their way of putting their hands behind their back and crossing their fingers. Um, th their word was not their bond. And that's, I think that is the heart of what's being said here. J. Vernon McGee, I'll leave you with a story that he, he said. He said, I, I can remember when my dad went to the bank one year to borrow money to get his cotton gin started. The banker was busy and said to my dad, go ahead and take the money. But my dad said, but I haven't signed the note. I never shall forget what the banker said. If you say you will repay it, that is just as good as if you have signed a note. So come in later and sign up. May I say unto you that a man's word ought to be just that good. Some people, even if they take an oath on a stack of Bibles, do not honor their word. And I think that's a good stopping place. So be a man or a woman of your word, especially if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is how we are to act because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Are you ready? If not, you better get ready. Call on the name of the Lord, repent of your sins, and ask Jesus Christ to save you. Until next time, I bid you shalom.